This episode is brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association, who invites you to give the gift of great beer this holiday season. A gift membership is the perfect way to bring friends and family into the homebrewing hobby. And what's more, you can choose a free book with your gift card purchase. Visit homebrewersassociation.org for details and make sure to place your order by December 15th to ensure you receive your free book in time for the holidays. That's homebrewersassociation.org. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, December 9th, 2021. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Chris Colby, author of How to Make Hard Seltzer, The Homebrew Recipe Bible, and Methods of Modern Homebrewing, introduces us to Yulol, Christmas beer from Norway. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. If you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs and our brewer's logbooks, which make great Christmas gifts, by the way. <laughs> you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basic brewing. And thanks to everybody who is helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basic brewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. Financial supporters have already seen the video episode that I'm planning to post on Friday about my revived rosemary lager. Lager being in quotation marks, by the way. I brewed it with an eight-month-old packet of Cape Bueno from Imperial Organic Yeast that, that I woke up with a starter. I dusted off my stir plate. Uh, Cape Bueno is a lager yeast, but my, my basement was a, was a bit too warm to be officially a lager, I suppose, at least in the primary fermentation stage. It's still very cleanly fermented, and it's getting more crisp in the keg as it goes. I had a pint last night. It, 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 uh, you know, is it lagering now? <laughs> uh, I'm planning my next batch, and I need to get into town to get the ingredients. Uh, the The ingredients are simple, but the process is a bit more involved uh, because I want to do a, a kettle soured beer. Now I know that I've I've been talking about this for weeks, but my my new pH meter finally arrived. It's been on back order, you know, supply chain issues and all that. Uh, I plan to brew up a a simple unhopped wort and raise it just to boiling to sanitize it chill it around to body temperature, and then uh, pitch W25 Lacto Brevis from our friends and sponsors at Imperial Organic Yeast. As the name implies, Lacto Brevis is a strain of Lactobacillus Brevis, and it should do great in that unhopped wort because it is hop sensitive. Um, now, Imperial says Lacto Brevis will typically drop wort pH to 3.3 in one to four days, uh, depending on the temperature and the inoculation rate. Uh, so it should be nice and happy in that warm wort over the days. A warm, un, unhopped wort. Uh, ask your local homebrew store for W25 Lacto Brevis and, and tart, tart up some, some wort for a nice sour beer yourself. Uh, you know we love Imperial, by the way. I like to say my stir plate is dusty because I don't use it anymore to make starters from standard gravity five-gallon batches. Uh, aside from... You know the 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 uh, the Cape Bueno one was a, was a uh, an anomaly because it was eight months old. That was that's twice the twice the age of the recommended shelf life. You know my airlocks are usually bubbling before bedtime because I use Imperial Organic Yeast. Check them out at imperialyeast.com. Now after I chill my unhopped wort to around body temperature and pitch. My lacto brevis from Imperial. How am I going to? How am I going to? How am I going to keep that wort at the temperature to make the souring organisms happy? Especially, you know, it's getting chilly here finally in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, I've done it before using my brew in a bag electric system from our friends and sponsors Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa. My 240 volt 10 gallon wort hog system is big enough to hold a five gallon glass carboy in a water bath inside the big old kettle. So it's easy. I just set the Warthog EBC-130 controller to whatever temperature I wanted the mash mode after adding enough water to uh, surround the fermenter because it's it's like sous vide for beer. Uh, and the controller holds the wort at the perfect perfect temp for days if I needed to. Uh, and, and, and by the way, 
There's good news from Desiree and Dave from HighGravityBrew.com. They're having a sale on money at HighGravityBrew.com. For a limited time, you can get High Gravity gift certificates for 10% off. So you can get a $100 gift certificate for $90, a $40 gift certificate for $36, and a $75 gift certificate for uh, $67.50. You get the idea. (laughs) It's a great time to tell Santa to load up a cart with HighGravityBrew.com gift certificates. They make great virtual stocking stuffers because you you can use them to get beer ingredients, uh, beer ingredient kits, wine kits, and, and fantastic equipment like a Warthog electric brewing system like mine to start off your new year in style. It's only for a limited time. The 10% discount will be taken automatically at checkout. So tell Santa to uh, help you take the pain out of propane and stock up on, on ingredients, too, with a $10 or 10% gift certificate, 10% off gift certificate <laughs> in the denomination of your choosing at family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. HighGravityBrew.com. So anyway, after after the wort sours uh, to a level that I like, I plan on, on boiling it just for five or ten minutes to sanitize and put some, some hops in there like a maybe Czech Sots, something fairly neutral, and uh, I'll ferment with something like Flagship from Imperial, and something clean, and uh, it, it's not over after that. I've still got three pounds of passion fruit puree that I want to add after primary fermentation. Uh, This time I'm putting it in the fermenter instead of just in the keg. What do you think? I've got high hopes for this one, so fingers crossed. Uh, I got a bunch of disaster stories from listeners for our annual disaster show. Hopefully that sour beer won't be among them. (laughs) Steve and I are going to record the disaster show on this upcoming Monday, so get yours in by the end of the weekend, if you want to be included in this year's show, send them to james at basicbrewing.com, and I'm looking forward to that. I got some comments after our first uh, or our most recent show with the uh, the bread yeast sampler that Steve and I did out on the porch. Uh, Dan Treffler from Space Time Meat and Cider Works commented that he was surprised that we got such spicy Belgianish character from the bread yeast because uh, they've done a commercial sized batch of mead with bread yeast with fairly neutral results, and I don't have an ex- explanation unless the uh, nutrients that Dan used in the uh, commercial batch at Space Time maybe help the bread yeast ferment cleanly. I don't know. We've done experiments in the past with bread yeast that yielded you know, fairly clean results, but I think I pitched like a whole packet into a small batch. So I don't know. Maybe your your mileage may vary if you venture out into using bread yeast. You might want to start with a small batch and see what happens. Oh, and don't forget to listen to the uh, Brulosophy podcast episode on bread yeast. Uh, I don't want to spoil it for you, but th- there were similarities and some differences in what they found in their experiment. So check that out. Uh, I'm going to take the next two weeks off from posting this podcast. Our son Drew's coming home for the first time since before the pandemic. So I want to make sure that I'm available to spend all the time possible with him. But we'll be back the last week of the year with The Disaster Show. It's always fun to talk to Chris Colby. His books, How to Make Hard Seltzer, The Homebrew Recipe Bible, and Methods of Modern Homebrewing, uh, they also make great Christmas gifts. Uh, We did a lot of talking about a certain language app, and I swear they're not sponsors. (laughs) I should send them a bill (laughs) after this show. (laughs) I just use the free version myself. So, um... Uh, quiero hablar con Chris. Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. James, manga and talk for having me on the show. <laughs> De nada. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, that's manga and talk is uh, basically thanks a lot in Norway. <laughs> and, I, and I mentioned it just in case, you know, if we... If we happen to talk about, uh, you know, Norwegian Christmas beers. <laughs> the funny. off chance that that's the topic for today. Funny, funny. You should uh, you should bring that up <laughs> on this completely random call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah you're, I mean, that's, that's what the random topic generator came up with? Yeah. <laughs> wow. No, I, yeah, you're, you're learning like seven different languages or something on, uh, on this Duolingo app. Uh, and mm-hmm. one of them is uh, Norwegian, 
and yep. uh, I'm I'm brushing up on my my Spanish that I uh, that I took you know Spanish one and two in high school and nine hours of Spanish in college, and wow. up until I started using that app, the only thing I could remember to say was mis zapatos son negros, which <laughs> only works when my shoes are actually black. But now I can say <laughs> mis zapatos son marrones because Marone. they're brown. So nice. I can also talk about green T-shirts, uh, camisetas uh, verdes, and uh, you know all kinds of stuff like that. So, and then and then uh, my wife Susan is is taking Welsh for some reason. So the other day I heard some some horrible noises coming from the other room. I thought she was choking. Turns out she was just practicing. So yeah, <laughs> that's, that's Welsh. <laughs> no offense to the Welsh, <laughs> but according to Ancestry dot com. Uh, I'm mostly, big surprise, uh, from Great Britain and Western uh, Europe, but like 2% of my genetic material comes from Norway, like a, oh. like I say, according to the thing, you know, for which I spit into a jar and, and mailed it off. Uh, so I'm assuming that that's Viking. <laughs> yeah. I'm assuming, uh, yeah. I'm assuming that's marauders coming over uh, to, to, to the uh, British Isles there and and uh, adding their contribution to my genetic material, so to speak. Yeah, that's that's a good guess, actually. <laughs> <laughs> they were outgoing. <laughs> Gregarious. Yeah, <laughs> that was the name of the one of the Viking explorers, wasn't it? Gregarious. <laughs> no, that was a Roman. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so do you have you got some Norwegian uh, blood in you? Uh well I, I took the the twenty three and me thing and it uh the first result I got was three quarters Scandinavian and one quarter uh uh English, which matched pretty well with the fact that I have three Norwegian grandparents and one Welsh. Uh but then they later revised it to like ninety nine percent Scandinavian. I was like, uh <laughs> The quarter of my genome just like degrade or something. I don't know. <laughs> you better. There's a there's a Norwegian mailman or, <laughs> or milkman. <laughs> the Welsh part of my genome is all consonants that don't, don't show up in other. <laughs> <laughs> it's only only the T's and the G's and the C's, no A's. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's a science joke. Did that work? Is it? That... <laughs> sure. I, don't ask me to say what those letters stand for. Ad adenine, guanine, cyto cytosine, uh, thymine, adenine, guanine, and yeah, so, cytosine. Yeah, was, uh, yeah. I need to take Duolingo for science now. And your uracil, if it's RNA. Uracil. I used to put that on my face in high school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Didn't help. <laughs> So, so we're here to, to, in a timely fashion. I guess if we were timely, we would have talked about this a couple of months ago to give people time to brew this stuff. But, you know, they can be sure. looking in the archives for next year. Right. So so what are we here to talk about today? Uh, Yule Ol. It's uh, basically a Norwegian uh, Yule Ale or, or Christmas beer. Mm. And there's a lot of – this came from an article that you wrote, correct? Yeah, um, I wrote an article and it got published in uh, Mother Earth News, uh, the December 2021, January 2022 edition. And yeah, it's all about Yule Ol, which is a, uh, uh, it's not a Johnny Come Lately uh, uh, thing in, in, you know, with Norwegian and like a craft beer renaissance. It's been, Norwegians have been brewing uh, holiday beers for way back into the Viking era. In fact, way back at you know, in 900 uh, and leading up to 1275, uh, it was required if you were if you were the owner of a farmstead, it was required that you brew enough beer uh, for you, uh, all your servants, all your slaves, uh, everybody, and you if you didn't brew, you were penalized, and if you didn't brew for three years in a row. Uh, you were stripped of your land, all your money was taken away, and you were, you know, SOL. Mm. So, the, and, and what was the purpose? And why, why, why was it uh, regulated so? Um, it was part of part of the attempt to Christianize 
uh, Scandinavia. I mean, most of that was uh, the Christians would come and kill people who didn't agree with them. But then they also tried to associate Christianity with with fun and festivity around the, uh, uh, you know, uh, make a switcheroo of Yule, uh, the, the you know the holiday, winter holiday celebration of the Scandinavians. You know, start to switch it into be Christianity, and so uh, they they main are they mandated that that you know you must produce beer uh, every every Christmas, and uh, beer production back then was like back in the Viking Age and and slightly thereafter. Um, you know, it was typically done in in individual farmhouses. Uh, a woman, more often than not, the, the woman was a brewer, and she would brew. Uh, for special occasions, like wedding ales were a big thing. If you, if someone on your farm was getting married, uh, you know, you would brew a batch, or you, if you're the, if the female brewer, would brew, you know, a, a special batch of beer. And there was, uh, like, the strength of the beer and the quality of it was like a reflection of of your farmstead. So, so wedding ales tended to be, you know, uh, brewed with care. And then Christmas ales also were. Or the the other like the the biggie you know mm. uh, that you really wanted to to do a good job on you know to the point that most Christmas beers were uh, all all barley malt. Um, other other special beers during the year might have had uh, malted oats uh, and, and perhaps malted wheat uh, for for brewers in, in the very southern parts of Norway. And according to your article, which you kindly sent me. Uh, the the beer was associated with Christmas and Christianity, but there was also a lot of other uh, sort of uh, traditional uh, folk. Uh, how would you <laughs> traditions or or yeah, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, folk beliefs were mixed in. Um, one of them is that their uh, their Norwegian believed or, or at least pretended to believe. Uh, that there were these woodland creatures called the Nissa, who uh, were sort of sort of like elves, and they, they were sort of they're basically mischievous uh, uh, creatures, not not malevolent, but you know they you tried to stay on their good side, and the idea was if you didn't brew a, a good beer for Christmas, the Nissa would come and cause you know various little problems around your uh, your farmstead, so. You know, they would the, the the brewer would brew the beer and uh, make some some subsidiary things from it, like making some some wort cakes and, and stuff, and and would leave out, you know, a glass of glass of you know the the wort for the for the Nissa, and yeah, there was another oh, I can't remember the other name. There's a second name of a like the the Hundra. Let me look it up. <laughs> I have the article here. I, sh- I should remember. For for all the uh, Norwegian pedants out there who are yelling at their podcast yeah. device, uh, and, and they the people also uh, poured uh, poured beer onto the fields as well. Is, am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, at the uh, at the beginning of the next uh, planning session, they would they would save a little bit of the beer and pour it on the field as like a you know a good luck charm blessing that kind of thing. And why not? <laughs> Yeah, I'm just going to take all this uh, beer, honey, and go out to the field, and uh, I'm just going to pour it on the uh, on the field. So uh, when I come back with the empty vessel here in a few hours, and I might spill yeah. some on me. I might smell like beer, but I'm just I'm pouring it on the field. Yeah, I'm guessing it was more like a like a goblet full of ale rather than like barrels and barrels. You know. <laughs> and, and life was tough, and you did, you know, that, that's a, you know, that's a lot of agricultural product being poured like into the ground. But... <laughs> crop crop oh, dusting crop with the beer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's what happens after you drink the beer. <laughs> you, you crop dust the parties that you go to. Uh, the, the other the other mythological characters were the Holdra. Ah. Which are also another kind of forest people, and same sort of idea. And I mean, the the old Norwegian brewing traditions where you were required to they lasted a long time, and they covered a lot of, you know, a, a fairly big country. And and so the uh, it's not there was it's not like there was one exact tradition that every place held exactly the same way that they, you know different places had their their own beliefs and and you know different times they evolved and. 
and stuff like that. But uh, the the requirement was it was a thing throughout all Norway, and you know the the idea that that some sort of folk creatures are, uh, you know, paying attention to your beer production was was a thing. Our friend and sponsor, mead maker Ricky from Groenfell and Havoc Meaderies up in Vermont, tells me that there are now three holiday feast mead bundles available at Groenfell.com that you can get shipped to you. There's uh, the Flight of the Bee bottle and can combo, which has Valkyrie's Choice, Nordic Farmhouse, Psychopomp, and a 750 milliliter bottle of Winter Warmer, which is based on a 17th century wassail. And then there's there's the uh, We All Cook Together bundle featuring Hop Swarm for prepping the meal, Valkyrie's Choice for serving, Wild Hunt for dessert, mm, and Old Wayfarer for telling stories afterwards. And finally, the All Day Affair bundle is comprised of Brag Eye, Hegir, Starry Olsa, and and the Winter Warmer. Now that's a that's a delicious journey. That uh, it should be shared with friends and family. And, and I still have a bunch of uh, craft meads from Groenfell and Havoc in my beer fridge from the last order that I made. I got a I got a case, and I'm 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 savoring them. I'm <laughs> I'm sharing them uh, with with friends and family though. So delicious. Check out all the craft mead deliciousness at family owned and operated Groenfell dot com. That's G R O E N N F E L L. And what was the uh, the equipment and procedures like in uh, back in the olden times? I mean, would we kind of recognize uh, the process? Yeah, very definitely. Um, I mean, they they mashed in in a louder ton. Uh, the the big difference is that the uh, the false bottom would be uh, juniper branches. So uh, the the beer or, or you know the mash would sit on top of the the bottom of, of the, the mash tun, which would be wooden, they, you know, they'd pour the boiling water in. And when they drained it, it would, they would drain through these, these juniper branches, which would hold back the, uh, the, the grains, uh, but would also infuse the beer with sort of a gin-like characteristic. We talked about uh, uh, Viking brews and Scandinavian brews with uh, Lars Maria Skarshul and uh, Mika Leitinen on the show before. Juniper uh, can also be used, uh, along with being a flavoring agent, it can be also, also be used uh, as a, a tea and sanitizing uh, the brewing equipment as well, which is interesting. Hmm. Um, and uh, so, so do the tastes today uh, in Norway and in, in, in Scandinavia, do they still like their Christmas beers? Yeah, it's, it's actually a, a sort of... It's a big deal in in Norway. The uh, modern Norway alcohol is taxed like very very heavily, and uh, you also it's illegal to advertise alcohol. Uh, but every uh, every Christmas, the state run liquor stores have, have you know they they basically clear out a, a lot of their beer selection and replace it with uh, the Yule's brewed by the various breweries and the press basically writes uh you know sort of a listicles or what you know like what are the best 10 yules this year and 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 it's a relatively big big deal people go and you know um like i said beer is expensive most of the time but uh, you know around christmas you go you splurge a little bit buy some buy some good beer and uh yeah it's it's uh, it's a big deal. I'm just talking in circles now. <laughs> <laughs> so do, is the character of the beer similar across the line? You know, are there recognized sort of style guidelines for what a Yulol is? And, uh, you know, do people kind of stay around that, that same theme or, or is it all over the board? Thank goodness. No, there's no style guidelines for people to frown about. Uh, <laughs> It's it, it's it's any beer you brew around the Christmas you know or for the Christmas season is a Yule oil. Um, I mean they they tend to be sort of dark strong beers, uh, you know, and you know some modern you know craft beer interpretations are going to have a little juniper or some uh, spicing other than hops. But there's I mean it's basically uh, you know just 
any any brewery that makes a specialty holiday, you know, end of the year holiday beer, that's a Yule. Hmm. So, um, yeah, there's it's you know it's nice. So if you want to brew, uh, uh, you know, quote unquote traditional Norwegian Yule, pretty much make whatever beer you want and call it that, <laughs> <laughs> and then you're you know fitting in with their tradition. So it seems like you would need like a newspaper guide or something to to uh, navigate through. Uh, the different uh, brands and such, unless, you know, you were already familiar with them. If if they're kind of all over the road, uh, it seems like you'd need some help. Yeah. Um, various breweries put out, you know, it's a little bit like, uh, uh, you know, Sierra Nevada Celebration. That's the mm. same, you know, at least roughly the same beer every year. You know, so if once you get to know the, what this brewery puts out, uh, then you get to know. But if if you didn't, you'd have to, yeah, you'd have to try it. And, uh, you know, like I said, most of them, they tend towards heavy, dark beers, but, but not, not all of them. There, there are some pale ones. So if you're a, a home brewer, uh, as, as, as many, if not all of our listeners are, and you wanted to next year brew a Yule All, what are some sort of, I mean, you say it's, you know, all over the road or, you know, it's up to interpretation, but how would you start? I mean, what would uh, be the the base malts that you would use? Well, um, in this article I wrote, I, I actually gave my recipe, the one that, that I use when I make Yule Lull, uh, and you can, uh, if you just search for Frost Giant Yule Lull, J-U-L-E-O with a slash to it, L, uh, that should pop up, and and mine is a sort of big surprise here, a strong, dark beer, and then I, I had the one tick is I had some aquavit to it at the end hmm. to bump it from from eight to nine percent alcohol, and it also aquavit adds the you know the uh, characteristic cardamom flavor and and other spices that are in aquavit, which is a uh, a, a distilled spirit from uh, from Scandinavia. Hmm. So like I go. You know, I go heavy on sort of a, a darker pale malt, if that makes any sense. Like a, you can use like an English pale ale. It's around three love a bond as most of the base. But then, you know, add some uh, add some Munich malt or Vienna or or a mixture of those two. You know, sort of a the you know quote unquote multi malts. You know, uh, get some flavor that way. And then, uh, you know, a little bit, a little bit of dark crystal or melanoidin, or you know, some of those uh, more color malts that that add just a little bit of sweetness. Um, I mean, I, I I personally like beers on the drier side, so I don't I don't load it up with with those sweetsy malts uh, like a, like a lot of crystal or whatever. But I mean, if that's what you want, uh, you know, more more full bodied, more sweet, you you could add more of that. And yeah, the malts are just, and then you, if you want to put in a little bit of dark, dark roasted malt, you know, like a black malt or a roasted barley or, or, a, or like chocolate malt, you know, just uh, basically enough for a little color. That's cool too. I, the most recent beer I brewed was uh, a beer that with a hundred percent, ten love of on Munich as the the malt. Uh, hmm. And then uh, a, a bit of Czech sots at the beginning of a 60-minute boil uh, just for bittering. And then uh, I did a – well, it, it normally would be a hop stand after the boil, but it, it, mm -hmm. it, it was a rosemary stand because I used rosemary from my garden. Wow. So wow. It, it's no, it's probably not as high in gravity as, you know, a traditional Yule All, but, uh, you know, I guess – I could I could call it Yule All Light. <laughs> you can call it whatever you want. <laughs> Traditionally, I mean, I guess in the in the early days they didn't have hops at all. Uh, so with the sort of more traditional, if you're leaning toward the more traditional version, uh, you would just use hops, maybe just for bittering. Yeah, um, I mean back. Back way back in the day, before they used hops, you know things like bog myrtle and the, uh, you know, a lot of the sort of bitter, uh, bitter herbs that show up in a lot of gruits, you know, were, were made their way in there. And because you know juniper adds a little, uh, not really bitterness, but there's there's a certainly there's a definitely the, the gin flavor or whatever. So you can, you can spice it up if you want to, and then that fits well with the the Christmas theme. Um, 
or, or you can uh, go easy on that. I mean, I would I add hops to mine, but uh, I go uh, not too not too hoppy. I like enough hop bitterness to uh, to sort of balance the sweetness, and then I, I have like a very little bit of finishing hops, just just like a, a hint, because in a you know in a uh, a thicker winter beer, you don't necessarily you know you're not looking for it to be an IPA, uh, or at least I'm not when I brew it. So I so I go easy on the on the finishing hops. And it seems like to me that uh, that this would be a good candidate for a no chill. Uh, which I tend to do if I don't add any hops other than just, you know, for bittering at the beginning of the boil. Uh, you know, if I'm if I'm not adding a bunch of hops either at a hop stand or near the end of the boil, I just, you know, rack it into a no-chill uh, container and, and set it overnight and then pitch it the next day. I'll just say sure. <laughs> Skeptical of the no-chill, are we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have. There's techniques I like, and there's techniques I, I'm not sold on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should come up, and I'll, I'll give you a, 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 I'll serve you a sample of my, uh, that, of course that that rose, no, 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 the rosemary beer, rosemary beer wasn't a no chill because I wanted to preserve as much of that rosemary character as possible. But uh, yeah, I've done a bunch of no chills. Uh, it's it's a real thing. <laughs> I, oh, I know it's a real thing. <laughs> I just don't. I just don't hold on. I pitch it the next day. I don't hold on to it for you know six months. Uh, yeah, un- unfermented. Uh, that's probably where your hesitation uh, lies. But but that we don't want to. We don't want to bring up old uh, <laughs> plow up old fields. <laughs> no, we just want to pour beer on them and <laughs> no, <that's right. laughs> keep just... going. And plant the next crop. <laughs> So spices would would you? I mean, what just holiday spices? Are you are you thinking about uh, you know just the traditional uh, kind of? If you wanted to use spike, of course, you know you can use whatever you want to in this thing. But uh, you know, it seems like uh, you know the clovey kind of uh, nutmeggy stuff, maybe cinnamon. Yeah, and I mean any you know think of any Christmas cookie that you like, uh, spice it up like that if you want. And, you know, and again, there's no. It's not a it's not a fixed thing. It's what every brewery does. So you could have, you know, you could have an entirely clean beer, you know, that's just hops, no other flavors, and that's fine. Or you could have one that, you know, with with some cinnamon or you know, like you said, some nutmeg or, you know, uh, I spice mine with a uh, akavit, which is uh, boosts the alcohol and gives the you know, the the, you know, the flavors of akavit if you've ever had it, uh, in there. Now, uh, I guess traditionally, you know, they didn't have clean brewer's yeast uh, back in the day. Um, and in some of the Scandinavian uh, brews like sati, they use uh, baker's yeast, uh, you know. But if you want to uh, – so I guess – and Steve and I just did a, a, a bread yeast sampler uh, on last week's show – and got some interesting clovey, uh, banana e character out of that. Um, so I guess you know, you, with the yeast again, you could experiment with whatever you wanted. You could, um, like way back in the day, they used to have the community would have like, like either sort of a mash pedal, although it wasn't wasn't the mash pedal, or or like a shovel kind of thing, like a big wooden. A stirring device and when you it was your turn to brew you would go to your local it was usually stored at a church you'd go to your local church and get that and when the wort was cool you would stir the uh uh stir the the, the beer to be with it and the uh the yeast from you know potentially centuries of of brewing uh have soaked into that wood and that would inoculate your beer and then also you know, I'm not. I'm not sure the exact the cuss. If you wait it, like, stuck it in there the next day before returning it, you know, so it, it got more replenished yeast. But anyway, they had, you know, they would inoculate the the beer with wood essentially, mm. uh, or the you know the the yeast uh, that would take residence in wood. So yeah, for for modern thing, you know, uh, modern beer, you could you know you can use uh, you could use commercial yeast. 
and there, there you know there's all these new uh, Scandinavian strains coming out of you know Kvik yeast and all that. If I'm pronouncing that correctly, which I don't know if I am, uh, <laughs> I, I I've heard Kvik, but uh, but uh, other people say Kvik Kvik. I don't know. I I get criticized every time I say it, so I'm not an authority. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, <laughs> I know I know how to write it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, so you've got again it's, you know, when when you've got something that's it it's it's a yule all by uh you know designated that because of the time of the year that it's brewed and and of course you're supposed to put, you know, some extra effort into it rather than fitting hitting some style guidelines, you know, you have uh you know, you can do literally anything you want. And so I guess that same answer uh, goes on to uh, whether to uh, lager or not. Yeah, I mean, it's it's winter. You know, in Scandinavia, they had plenty of opportunity to store things cold. And they the traditional brewing was, uh, like, November the 1st was about the last day that you could, you know, if you didn't get it brewed by then, it didn't count as, as brewing a, a Yule Oil. Uh, so, you know, they would definitely store it for, you know, from November through most of December. Uh, and, you know, they didn't call it lagering, of course, because uh, it's a German word. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure the beer was cold conditioned. It wouldn't have any opportunity to be anything else, really. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, it sounds like a, it sounds like a fun a fun thing to do, especially because there's not <laughs> there's not strict guidelines. Uh, you know, you you can't uh, pull up your brewing software and move the sliders around, you know, to fit into the style guidelines for a Yule all. Yeah, um, I mean that's then to me that's a great thing. Make a beer, make a beer you like. You know, um, uh, mine is you know uh, the the frost oil. Frost oil, my, my frost giant Yule. Uh, it's it's eight percent alcohol, uh, just the beer, and then you add enough Akavit to make, to pop it up to nine. If you want, you can leave out. It's still a still a perfectly good beer, uh, and you can also you could leave half of it as as just beer and and you know spike the second half mm. to you know get get two two batches for the price of one, and yeah, so it's like a you know uh eight percent beer it's it's reasonably dark it's not not stout dark it's more you know dark uh dark brown with with some red 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 hints to it um it's you know i i brew it relatively dry given the style it's not it's not bone dry but it's it's not it's not loaded up with crystal malts and it's not uh uh mashed at you know super high temperatures and yeah it, you know so it's a sort of mid body beer it's got uh it's got enough it's, it's got like 42 ibus so it's not you know without hops but it's not you know especially by today's standards it's not it's not strong ipa hopped mm-hmm. yeah it, it's just nice nice balanced biggish beer and then if you had the the booze to it on top of that it's a, a nice almost balanced very boozy beer <laughs> and then you'll be unbalanced after you yeah, drink it can, yeah <laughs> So what would you what would you cook? Uh, what would you cook to go with your Yule all? You you I see you on the social medias posting pictures of you making uh what are they potato pancakes? Yes, lefsa. That's a yeah, Norwegian uh Norwegian American uh favorite. Uh I mean they 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 make lefsa in in Norway, but it's it's I think more popular amongst uh emigres than uh than the actual population. Uh yeah, over there they serve, uh, and there's also uh, for Norwegian Americans there's also lutefisk, which is a cod that's been soaked in sodium hydroxide or, or lye, uh, and then uh, the lye is all rinsed from it, and it, it's this sort of weird, weird tasting fish that people are very uh, divided about whether it's you know an abomination or or you know a, a delicacy. <laughs> Uh, it's it's best served with a uh, lots of cream gravy over it. Ooh. Uh, but uh in in Norway itself, uh two of the more popular Christmas dishes are a ribba, which is just pork ribs, and a 
pina jot, which is jot is meat in a uh, uh, Norwegian, and pina means stick, and it's it that's lamb ribs because the the rib you know sticks out, so it's stick meat. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to what you get at the fair. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking. I was thinking. I was thinking. What other food do I know of that's been treated with lye? And uh, I think hominy. I think corn is treated with uh, lye to get uh, hominy, and yes, then, and then hominy mixed, grits. Nixtamalized with a uh, yeah, low pH something or other. So oh, I'd have to look it up. So I, 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 I'd try it. I'd try that fish. Yeah, it, it's you know back back before refrigeration. Uh, yeah, people were people were desperate to find ways to preserve, you know, food, including fish they caught. And uh, in in Norway, there was uh, fermentation. Uh, you know, there there's a rat fisk in in uh, Norway, which is a uh, fermented fish. Uh, then there was you know salted and dried was another way to preserve fish. And uh, apparently, somebody figured out that soaking it in in a very basic solution you know very alkaline mm. solution would you know uh preserve it and then you could rinse all that out you know immediately prior to cooking it <laughs> and con- congratulations on that person for not dying <laughs> yeah it's also i mean they lived where it was just freezing freaking cold all the time <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Like they didn't really need refrigeration a lot of times. <laughs> set something outside. But the world. It, the it wor- gets you know it gets warmer during the summer, obviously. The it's world not, is a deep freeze. Or not? Yeah. Well, Chris, this has been fun. This is uh, probably the last, uh, the last time we'll talk in twenty what twenty twenty one. Yeah. So uh, uh, feliz Navidad and uh, uh, feliz Nuevo Año. Yeah. I think I I'm, said that right. I can't wait to hear all the people who actually speak Norwegian right into the show and tell me how I've been butchering all these terms. <laughs> <laughs> well. I'm trying. I'm learning on the Duolingo. <laughs> I want to be able to speak Norwegian well at some point. What, what's your fa- We'll end with your favorite Norwegian phrase that you've learned on Duolingo. Bjornen Dricker Icky. Uh, and ul, which is uh, the bear is not drinking a beer. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, the bears there apparently don't read newspapers either. Yeah. <laughs> Your, I, I, Vizer, icky. I can't remember and, the Spanish word for bear. I know the Spanish word for pair for dog, so I could say el perro. No hmm. está bebiendo la cerveza. I think Hun I... is a Norwegian for dog. Oh, there you go. Is it basically the same as German? Spelled the same. Well, there you go. There you go. All right. Well, I appreciate it, Chris. We'll talk to you next year. Yes, in the 2022. Well, thanks again to Chris. Be sure to check out his books, How to Make Hard Seltzer, The Homebrew Recipe Bible, and Methods of Modern Homebrewing. He's an excellent writer. And read his uh, full article on Christmas beers in Norway in Mother Earth News as well. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. We will be back the last weekend of of the year. Uh, Until then, thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page, or the last week of the year. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Until next time, Till then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voice, and we'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime... Stay well and stay tuned. So long.